Good evening. I'm Dr. Stephen Pilkington, Associate Professor of Sacred Music at Westminster Choir College of Ryder University. It was out of a great enthusiasm and admiration for African American sacred music that shortly after arriving at Westminster, I put the Westminster Jubilee Singers into our curriculum over 25 years ago. It's been a wonderful run for this incredible choir and its various directors. Tonight, as we look towards our future, we herald a new project, Inside the Music. This series will focus on the music of various black composers working in the sacred music tradition. In addition to inspiring performances, you will hear in-depth interviews with each composer whose music is being presented. We're very excited about showcasing not only the music, but also the opportunity to be in conversation with the living composer. And so, let's get on with this first program and get inside the music. Dr. Rosephany Dunn Powell has been hailed as one of America's premier women composers of choral music. She has an impressive catalog of works published by some of the nation's leading publishers, including the Hal Leonard Corporation, the Fred Bach Music Company Gentry Publications, Oxford University Press, Alliance Music Publications, and Shawnee. Dr. Powell is commissioned yearly to compose for university choruses, professional, community, and church choirs, as well as secondary school choruses. Dr. Powell's works have been conducted and premiered by nationally renowned choral conductors, including, but not limited to, Anton Armstrong, Philip Brunel, Bob Chilcott, Rodney Eichenberger, Tom Hall, Albert McNeil, Tim Selig, and Andre Thomas. Dr. Powell's compositions include sacred and secular works for mixed chorus, women's chorus, men's chorus, and children's voices. Dr. Powell serves as professor of voice at Auburn University. She holds degrees from the Florida State University, Westminster Choir College, and Alabama State University. Dr. Powell served on the faculties of Philander Smith College and Georgia Southern University prior to her arrival at Auburn University in 2001. 
As a researcher, Dr. Powell's recent articles include Keeping the Choir in Show Choir, published in the American Choral Directors Journal, William Grant Still, His Life and His Songs, and the African American Spiritual Preparation and Performance Considerations, both published in the prestigious Nats Journal of Singing. Dr. Powell has received numerous awards, including the Living Legend Award, presented by California State University African Diaspora Sacred Music Festival in Los Angeles. She was listed in the first edition of the international publication, Who is Who in Choral Music, and she has been included in Who's Who Among America's Teachers and Outstanding Young Women in America in recent years. As the Deer uh, takes text from the Psalter and um, is a Psalm of David that speaks to, to longing. Dr. Powell, can you tell us a little bit about the origin of this work, how this work came into being, um, and your process for composing this work? I was uh, commissioned to compo compose this work by uh, Judith Willoughby and the Texas Collegiate Women's Chorale. And I imagined David uh, when he was writing this psalm um, in a time when he was fleeing from Saul. I was trying to go for more of a contemporary feel, uh, bridging uh, many of uh, the colors from African-American music. There are, some, there are some jazz flavors in parts. There, there are some uh, gospel flavors in other parts. When we get to the whale at the end, that's from the African-American spiritual. But I was trying to put all of them to, to depict David alone crying out to God, yearning for water, knowing that if one does not in this desert find water, one perishes. Now, what are some things that listeners should consider or should be looking out for when they listen to the Jubilee singers perform uh, this work? Well, I would say from the beginning, they, they should be listening to the piano which sets the mood. I'm hoping that it puts their ear in the mind of a deer that's wandering. It's, um, its head is drooping down because the sun is beating down upon it. It's looking for the water. This deer has, is not around other deer. It's, it's lost even in that it's, it's, it's not even with the mother. Also the fact that it begins unison, again, painting this, the picture of this deer who represents David, he is by himself because David had a group of men who uh, served alongside of him. But in this particular cave, he is by himself. So I wanted to begin with the sense of oneness. And then when we, we start moving to this B section where David says, my tears have been my food day and night while men say to me all day long, where is your God? They will hear the piano start to build in octaves, uh, creating agitation to say that David, though he trusts in God, he's remembering all the people who have mocked him. It's almost as if he's questioning, these people are saying you don't exist. Where are you? Now I'm going to tell you what they said, but in a way I'm telling you, I'm asking. Where are you? Prove that you are God. So we've now moved from this longing, feeling weak to him saying, my tears, I, I, one of the reason, uh, reasons that I'm struggling here is that my tears have been my food day and night. I think most of us can relate to being depressed or so melancholy. We don't want anything to eat. And David says, this is where I am, that my tears, my crying, my wailing, has been my food day and night while people say to me, where is your God? And then when we get to measure 32, we've got another little section where it becomes, I guess we, we should say it starts to move more towards pot being positive. Well, at this point, he's moved from I'm lonely, I'm distraught to I'm angry. And now he says, flashback, I remember when I had killed Goliath and, and, and all the people loved me. 
if the audience listens, they will be able to hear that I have a little Israeli dance in the piano up under this verse because I wanted them to hear the Israeli celebration as they were all praising and giving God thanks for what he had done. That's when I lead them into the well. Why? Because he's already, he's already been distraught. He's been angry. He's now gone back in his mind to celebrate. And it's just, it's just taken the wind out of him to remember the good days has, has left him weak. And as we know in the African-American community, when we are at our weakest, that's when the words won't come and all we can do is just wail. And, and as, as my grandmother and so many back in the, in the day used to say, when you, when you hum or you moan, the devil doesn't know what you're saying. And so after he does all of that, he reminds himself after all of those emotions, I still pursue you. I still yearn for you. And so it, the song goes full circle in this little small coda of as the deer pants for streams of water. So my soul pants for you, oh God.
David Hurd is a New York-based concert organist, church musician, teacher, composer, and choral conductor. Educated principally at the Juilliard School, Oberlin College, and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, he directed chapel music and taught at the General Theological Seminary for nearly four decades. He has also taught at Duke University, Yale University, the Manhattan School of Music, and Westminster Choir College. He has been director of music at the Church of the Holy Apostles, All Saints Church, and the Church of the Intercession, and has served in various capacities in other New York churches. His musical accomplishments have been recognized with four honorary doctorates and various other national and international awards. In 1977, he received first prizes both in organ playing and in improvisation from the International Congress of Organists. More recently, he was awarded the 2010 Distinguished Composer Award of the American Guild of Organists. Many of his compositions are widely performed and he is well represented in major church hymnals in the US and abroad. Dr. Hurd is represented by Philip Truckenbrot, concert artists. The tenors and basses are excited, the tenors rather, are excited to um, dive into uh, VD Aquam. Um, but before we do that, uh, would you share with us just a little bit about your um, affiliation with the choir college? I certainly have known of the choir college for my whole life. I got to know more about it uh, through some alumni several years ago, but but through primarily organ departments uh, uh, sponsoring of European study tours back in the 1970s, in the late 70s. Um, and I went on one of those trips uh, that uh, Joan Lettenkopf um, had uh, hosted. And then later on, I was invited to uh, teach a, a class uh, in composition. Uh, and, um, and so I, I actually did a little bit of a stint as an adjunct faculty member. Vidi Aquam, I Saw Water, uh, is a piece for two-part ensemble with organ accompaniment and with handbell accompaniment, and we are excited uh, to dive into it. Uh, would you share with us just a little bit of the history of the piece, how it came into being, and your compositional process? I was uh, the um, uh, 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 directing uh, a, a conference, of a, a, a church music um, uh, festival actually for the Archdiocese of Chicago uh, and uh, that was going to be uh, primarily at um, the uh, 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 cathedral, uh, Roman Catholic Cathedral in Chicago, holy name. As the director of the conf uh, conference uh, they were going to sing some music of mine and at the very last minute I was asked, oh um, could I write something for the uh, sprinkling. Normally, this is done rather quickly uh, in a, a, a Catholic mass, but uh, in this festival, they were going to go up the aisles and down the aisles and all around the church and, and uh, do a, a much more elaborate sprinkling. So they wanted a piece that, uh, that actually could be extended for several minutes. That, that's why there's a whole page of performance directions because it, the piece can be done quite simply um, or it can be done at great length, all according to what one wishes to do. It had to be learned quickly, um, like at the conference. <laughs> so so um, I, I went to the basic plain song model of, of, of something that would be uh, fluid in Lydian mode um, and that uh, could actually work as a single line or a, as a canon in two voices. The accompaniment has two acts, uh, aspects. There's the, the 16th notes that are flowing. And um, of course, uh, picking up on the text, I saw water flowing from the right side of the temple. It's the performance practice piece that, uh, that can be uh, adjusted to, uh, to the situation to a great extent. I can tell you with the Jubilee Singers, uh, we decided to follow the performance practices page to a T. So we begin with a, uh, a unison voice of the first choir part, um, then of the second choir part, bells being added in and uh, right hand organ, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, full organ with the ensemble singing choir one, and then the final verse being the canon with the uh, aleatoric like section at the end, uh, which creates a great moment for improvisation. 
Are there any images, uh, specific images, if any, that come to mind when uh, you think of this piece and things that we as listeners should be on the lookout for? Coming from the text, um, the, the image of flowing water um, is, uh, I think, is, is 100% of what the piece is about, is sort of, uh, uh, is sort of living into, into that, that image of flowing water. The Lydian mode just seemed to say that to me, that sort of a, um, the, the major-ish kind of sound with the raised fourth. <laughs> you know, the harmonic language is in, in fact um, not presupposing you know, a perfect authentic cadence anywhere. You know, it, it just it goes on sort of indefinitely and just uh, it's so a wash of F major, if you will, um, except with a raised fourth. <laughs> Dr. Hurd, thank you so very much for your time and again for your music. Uh, we look forward to sharing your setting of VD Aquam. Encourage our listeners to have um, open ears and open up heart as we receive the beautiful music that you've set.
Dr. Brandon Waddles, a Detroit native, is no stranger to the city's rich legacy of vocal music in schools. An alumnus of Renaissance High School, he was a member of the Renaissance High School Varsity Chorus under the direction of renowned music educator, Nina Scott. Waddles credits Scott and the late Dr. Brazil Denard as founding influences on his work in choral music. He went on to receive his BA in music from Morehouse College and an MM in voice performance and pedagogy from Westminster Choir College of Ryder University. Dr. Waddles earned his PhD in music education with a choral conducting emphasis at Florida State University. Before pursuing his doctorate, he served on the conducting and sacred music faculty at Westminster as conductor of the Westminster Jubilee Singers. As a composer, conductor, educator, and music director, Dr. Waddles enjoys a multifaceted career spanning the musical gamut. His choral compositions and arrangements have been published and performed by choral ensembles around the world, including the Morehouse College and University of Michigan Glee Clubs, Oakwood Aeolians, Westminster Choir, Brigham Young University Singers, and the Slovenian Philharmonic Choir. In 2019, he was awarded as the inaugural recipient of the ACDA Diverse Voices Collaborative Grant. For years, Dr. Waddles has worked as a transcriber of Black gospel music for numerous choral octavos, hymnals, and hymnal supplements published by GIA, including his recent work as a contributor editor for the One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism hymnal. He recently released Just In Case You've Forgotten, the first selected compendium of works by the late Thomas Whitfield, the subject of his dissertation. Dr. Waddles has worked with a diverse array of artists, most recently serving as music director for Grammy-nominated recording artist Lettucey, collaborating with the celebrated singer on multiple occasions, including her Nina and Me concert series and the Lettucey, The Legend of Little Girl Blue show run at the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts. At the heart of Dr. Waddle's work is his unwavering passion for Black sacred music, instilled within him at a very young age by his father, Alvin Waddles, one of Detroit's most beloved musicians. His areas of research focus on Negro spirituals, the evolution of contemporary gospel music, and the life and work of Thomas Whitfield. Thank you so very much for taking the time to look inside the music with us. So for those who may not know, can you tell us a little bit just about Thomas Whitfield um, and, and about the Whitfield sound? Absolutely. First of all, thank you, my, my brother and my friend, for having me on here. Thomas Whitfield, one of the defining progenitors of what we call contemporary gospel music, um, which is codified, credited as being started around 1968 and 69 with the advent of Edwin Hawkins's Oh Happy Day. Tommy, as he was referred to, you know, affectionately, uh, a lot of his career, professional career, recording career, started in the late 70s when he started the Whitfield Company and then throughout the 80s as he becomes one of the most sought after songwriters, producers, arrangers in the Black gospel community. Tommy, during the last month of his life, he died unfortunately very suddenly in 1992, comes into contact with three of the great armor bearers of the urban contemporary sound of gospel music in the 90s, Kurt Franklin, Donald Lawrence, and Kurt Carr. He had such an incredible effect on their music making. And if we acknowledge these three choir masters at the time to have been some of the foremost in helping to develop, further develop the sound of gospel through the latter end of the 20th century into the 21st, then it is for me no question um, that Tommy bridges the gap between the more classic sounds of, you know, a Reverend James Cleveland, um, a Reverend Charles Nix, the Reverend Dr. Maddie Moss Clark, and the revolutionary urban sounds of people like Kurt Franklin. Let's transition now a little bit about the, the songs that, uh, our listeners are going to hear. What they don't know is because of your relationship with, with me and with the ensemble that I, I really gave you freedom to, to, to select the songs that Jubilee would, would cover from the Thomas Whitfield um, catalog. 
Can you share a little bit about each piece with us, what listeners can expect to hear? There is nothing God can't do. You are going right back to the gospel that your, your, your mom and grandma had on, on the AM radio. That's what they had on the AM radio when you were getting ready for service. And it gives me, you know, Tommy still in the, that almost, you know, prayer tab, which is where he met James Cleveland, that classic sound of gospel. Look and Live sort of sits within the white Southern gospel vein. Um, there's a blessing from the Lord. Hallelujah. When you hear Look and Live, you are starting to hear some of that contemporary bounce. If we were to find a way to, you know, how, 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 how are we going to get the young folk to like singing these hymns? That's that. Look and, look and Live is a great great way to have done that, especially in the mid to late 80s. Let's talk about the role of Jubilee singers in a conversation in higher education regarding Black sacred music and and the platform that we've been given and the responsibility that we have to uh, continue to realize this music um, as part of the canon. Well, the first thing to bring um, to mind is that Westminster Jubilee Singers um, was formed by way of the fight. The fight is really that the human that created the culture, the humans that created the music would be validated along with. Um, because for the longest time, uh, Americans, black, white, whatever, have been enthralled with black music and culture, but they haven't been too keen about the humans that created it. And so when Jubilee fights to ensure that Jubilee stays, that Jubilee is considered just as important a part of Westminster as Westminster Choir, or symphonic or any of the other ensembles that are there. It is not just so that we can have a space to sing Thomas Woodfield and Adolphus Hale Stork and Undine Smith Moore. It is a place where a Brandon Waddles and a Vinroy Brown and a Helen and a Letitia and everybody else that has come through Westminster that even in the slightest bit felt marginalized um, or forgotten, that they would be seen as just as valid to academia and to American choral music. We could not continue to allow for the marginalization of a culture that is seemingly so loved with neglect of the humans that created it. That's, that's the larger fight. And that fight is not just a Westminster fight. The late John Lewis referred to it as good trouble. Good trouble. Good trouble, good trouble, good trouble. And, and, we, and we have to continue to stir it up. And we can't stop stirring it up until everybody realizes what the issue has been. Can't stray away from what the issue has been. Um, because once you have acknowledged it and taken hold of it and taken hold of your responsibility towards that issue, then you can, you know, make the gains and make strivings towards, towards the solution. We must find the human in the score. We cannot be, uh, we cannot find it solely solutional to perform Hogan and Gibbs at the end of a concert. It doesn't work anymore. It didn't work then, it's, and it's certainly not working now. I am grateful for your insight and for your humanity and, and the humanity that we seek to find continually, not only in the score, but in each other. Mm -hmm. 
And I am grateful for this place called Westminster that binds us together in, in brotherhood and in music and in fellowship. I look forward to seeing what Westminster will do in the, these next um, years, these next decades, these next scores over the next century. Um, because I still do believe that Westminster um, has a great deal to give. Um, and I believe that Westminster has a great deal to learn too. And that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. May we all continue to give and may we all continue to learn. On behalf of the Jubilee Singers 
At Westminster Choir College of Rodney University, we'd like to take a moment to thank you for viewing tonight's broadcast. In addition, we'd like to thank Dean Marshall Onofrio, Dr. Stephen Pilkington, Ann Sears, Carolyn Sauer, and the entire team that helped make tonight's broadcast possible. And until the next time we can be together, I hope that you remain well and safe.